Yep. So there's a lot of people still on Cold Fusion 11, and there are no more security patches. There's no more fixes. There's no more bug updates uh, to CF11. Um, so there's a lot of people with some upgrading to do. Um, you know, well, and Welcome back to the show. Today, we're here with Brad Wood from Autis Solutions, and we're going to be looking in detail at the results from the State of the Cold Fusion Union Survey 2019. So welcome, Brad. Hello. Thank you. Good to be here. And the, Yeah, good to have you here again. And for those of you who don't know, Brad is like the chief uh, intelligent uh, Cold Fusion, Cold Command Box, and other... I thought you were going to say Chief Monkey genius. there for a second. <laughs> well, maybe you do a bit of Chief Monkey on occasion. He, he gave an amazing number of talks into the box. He gave so many talks, I think he had to be split into parallel versions to be able to give the same talk at the same time in different rooms almost. Um, so anyway, good guy to check out. And his uh, blog is uh, Coders Revolution, if I remember right. Is that... It is. That's my personal blog, codersrevolution.com. I typically uh, blog stuff on the ordersolutions.com blog as well if it's box related. So, And occasionally he's seen on the uh, CF Slack channel as well. <laughs> occasionally. Like every five minutes. You know. <laughs> I, I actually, I just hit my 7,000th message in the general channel just a few Goodness minutes ago. Me. Wow. <laughs> there's, a little well, bot that, there's a little bot that keeps track of how much you talk and if you if you blabber oh. too much, it'll pop up and give you little kind of anniversary notices like, hey, your 10,000th <laughs> message, you know. Wow. Well, I think everyone listening appreciates all the support you give in the CF Slack channel and all over the interwebs. So I uh, appreciate you doing that. Anyway, today we're going to look at the uh, results of the Cold Fusion Union Survey. This is an annual survey that TerraTech runs for the Cold Fusion community. Mm. And it's uh, about 46 questions in it about all different aspects of cold fusion tools, people use frameworks, uh, you know, what people think about cold fusion and where it's going. So, yeah. And we really like this survey in order to give us a good kind of barometer of where the community is at. Um, you know, a lot of our open source libraries like cold box and content box, you know, we're, we're asking ourselves questions like, you know, what versions of cold fusion do we need to be supporting? What versions of loose do we need to be supporting? What databases are the most popular? And so the state of the CF union survey gives us a good kind of, uh, uh, you know, indicator of where people are at, what they're interested in, and uh, we kind of know what to focus on. So I always look forward to a survey every year. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to the guys that learn CF in a week yesterday on the podcast, and they were saying they use it also for the same kind of reason, like, you know, what should they be covering in that training material? So um, yep. Yep. very interesting. All right. Well, let's go to the first question, which is what version of Cold Fusion are people using? So, uh, and for folks who want to see this at home, if you just go to terratech.com and it, I'll read the URL, but you can, I'll put it in the show notes for the thing. It's uh, terratech.com slash state of the CF union 2019 final results with a bunch of hyphens thrown in between every word, but I'll <laughs> stick that URL in the show notes for this episode as well. Um, yeah. So it looks like the most popular version of cold fusion is uh, CF 2016. Uh, it is. Yeah, it came out on top. I was uh, just looking at this the other week. Um, and Lucy 5 is actually number two. So CF 11 is still very popular, um, which is interesting since Cold Fusion 11 is now officially out of uh, core support. That was at the end mm -hmm. of April, I believe. Uh, yep. So there's a lot of people still on Cold Fusion 11. And there are no more security patches. There's no more fixes. There's no more bug updates uh, to CF 11. Um, so there's a lot of people with some upgrading to do. Um, you know, 2018, well, and, and, and look at the number of people on Cold Fusion 10 and Cold Fusion 9. You yeah, know, honestly, about, I mean, that's, that's uh, over 40% over still on Cold Fusion uh, 10. Now, I mean, this is a multiple choice question. So presumably some people, you know, uh, have some servers in 2018 and maybe some servers left on 10. Uh, but yeah, still a significant number. Um, you know, we dropped support. Uh, like in the Coldbox framework for Cold Fusion 10 and prior with, with Coldbox 5. In fact, we, we axed 9 and 10 at the same time. Um, even, even with, you know, a large number of people still using it, uh, you know, the world has moved on. So people still stuck on some of those older versions are going to find it uh, harder to keep up to date on some of those frameworks and things in the community as well. 
uh, that are using the newer fe- newer features. I, I guess the good news is people using CF8, 7, 6, 5, or even earlier versions back into the prehistory of time, <laughs> um, uh, uh, there's pretty minimal numbers of folks still using those versions, at least yeah. two who answered the survey. I mean, so, so Lucy, um, Lucy 4 is now just about on par with Cold Fusion 9 at this point. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can't see the exact number. Let's see, does it tell me if I hover? 36%? I think those um, are absolute numbers rather than percentages. Perhaps. Oh, that's oh, that's 36 respondents? Okay. Yeah, and I, yes, I think we're 255 that. total, so a quick bit of math says it's just over 10%. Okay, got it. Um, I'll see yeah, if I can jigger the, jigger the calculations on the survey to do percentages next year. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I, mean, I think it's good to see that most, most Lucy people have moved to Lucy 5. Obviously, there's no licensing barrier there. It's just uh, you know, potential compatibility barriers. Uh, Adobe always seems to have a bit more of a spread. Um, what would be interesting, actually, in future years uh, would be to break out the Lucy versions uh, by a minor version. Um, cause mm-hmm. Lucy tends to stay in like the five X series for quite a few years and they really do treat minor releases almost as major releases. In fact, uh, they'll put, you know, breaking changes in a minor release. You know, 5.3 was a big jump over 5.2. Uh, mm-hmm. maybe next year we can break out some of those, uh, those Lucy five releases just since, mm-hmm. you know, Lucy five has been out for like what, three years or so now it's been quite a while. Um, mm. so that that's a fairly big bucket, whereas Adobe will have a new major release, but every two years, so they every usually two have, years, they're pretty committed yeah. to that. And next one up is 20, CF 2020 that's coming out. Yeah. I guess so at be, the end of the year, we're going to see some alpha versions of that out there and then beta. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll be interested in seeing the trajectory of 2018 next year. I mean, we're really kind of mm. just a year into 2018. I don't even know that we're that far. Um, so I mean, there's, there's a decent amount of pickup. Uh, already 64 respondents uh, using it, but you know, 2018 is still only about halfway as far as, as 2016 still has. So mm-hmm. um, it's a decent jump in the first year. It'll be interesting to see next year if 2018 is still continuing to be picked up uh, or if it stalls out at all. I, I think my guess is it will uh, pick up because they, it seems to be a reliable release. I haven't heard of any major screw ups. Uh, once it got a couple updates in, yes, it's been pretty good. Um, I talked to a lot of people who have a 2018 upgrade in progress. I have several clients in that exact same boat. Um, I did actually talk to someone this week whose company was upgrading to 2016, which seems like a, a pretty big waste of time <laughs> so, you know, to go through the upgrade process and not get all the way on the latest and greatest. Um, but, you know. Well, sometimes people only go to third base, Brad. You know. <laughs> yeah, can't get any further. Can't go any further. You know, they, they have restrictions, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it's just red tape, you know, um, yeah. sometimes uh, people, there's, there's actually several people, there's some conversations in Slack this week uh, that want to go to 2018, but they can't because there's, you know, an outstanding uh, bug here or there that, that's a blocker for them. Um, so I, I do expect that, you know, the next few updaters from Adobe will probably um, address some of those, uh, some of those bugs and things that have been uh, blocking people. And hopefully by next year that will have, you know, remove some of those barriers for a few of the people that are still waiting for that upgrade. Yeah. Now for those following us on uh, YouTube, I shared the, the screen of where it is and I'm hoping you are seeing it at your end, Brad. Brad cause, yeah. Um, yep. You can just, okay. just minimize that window there. Minimize that. Yeah, the is that better? There. there we go. Yeah. yeah. And maybe Perfect. I'll see if I can bump up the, resolution on this so we can actually there we go that's a bit better so i know people on audio can't see that so that's why we're going to describe what the results are but for those on youtube uh you can see what we're talking about too so that's what we have to use very descriptive words when we describe them mm. like like when people describe cheeses and wines you know this yes. graph is very earthy with overtones of flowers or something you know <laughs> There we go. I think with that thought, we better move on to uh, whether people are using enterprise or standard. <laughs> exactly. Now, this graph only applies to Adobe Cold Fusion, of course. Lucy only has one version, so I assume most of the non-applicable answers were, were Lucy users. This is right yeah. about half and half. It's a yeah. split, enterprise and standard. A lot of people do use enterprise. I mean, you know, has 
you know, you got the unlimited instances, and uh, I think there's some other features in there. That they, yeah, uh, Adobe has never has never had features unique to enterprise, but they've always throttled things. So you can create yeah. PDFs in standard, but it's limited to one thread at a time. Uh, which I, I, I like that model because at least you can, you know, any app will work on either version. You just can't scale it as much. Now, one of the big issues we've had with standard is you can't use an Adobe Cold Fusion standard license on command box because it, it technically registers as a J2E installation. It's a war deployment. Um, and they only allow that on enterprise, uh, which has been an issue for several of our clients. Um, mm. Supposedly Adobe is looking to, to change that. So command box servers can run a standard license, even though it's technically a war behind the scenes. Uh, but that's still, we haven't seen that materialize yet. I, I, I would encourage Adobe to support command box in this. I mean, uh, I also, I just want to do a shout out to uh, integral and fusion reactor who now have a command box uh, image out there. So and anyone else listening who has a third party tool for cool fusion, you should be talking to Brad to get, a, get that <laughs> image together. Yeah. There's a lot of people, a lot of people moving to Docker. Software. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of people moving to Docker. Uh, and I guess that's another good thing. So forget command box for a minute, even though I don't like to do that. Um, <laughs> if, you're, uh, if you're looking at, at Dockerizing, uh, the version, the license you have for Adobe Cold Fusion makes a big difference because that's another one of the big changes in the EULA uh, is uh, how the license uh, works in regard to Docker. So if you have an Adobe Cold Fusion standard license, uh, my understanding, if I'm reading this correctly, with the, the typical... I'm, not a lawyer, right, you know, disclaimer, um, you can, you would have to have a separate standard license for every instance of a, of a Docker container you wanted to spin up. Whereas uh, with the enterprise license, uh, you have more freedom to use that same license to cover uh, multiple containers on the same, uh, the same VM or the same server with the typical CPU restrictions in place, um, eight cores. So if you're looking into moving to Docker and you're on Adobe Cold Fusion, you definitely want to be on the enterprise license or it's, uh, it, it wouldn't really be tenable from a, a licensing standpoint. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm hoping with the, you know, the announcement that Cold Fusion 2020 is going for more cloud support and microservices and things. I'm hoping they're going to rationalize their licensing for the cloud because. Well, yeah, and that's a good really... direction to see Adobe moving in. They've always catered yeah. towards the traditional kind of monolith servers. I mean, that because that was the web, right, for for decades. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and there's stuff now like uh, Fuseless, which is Pete Freitag's library to run CFML on the AWS Lambda, you know, and it only supports Lucy because honestly, there isn't even licensing in place to allow that kind of thing with Adobe. And I'd love to see Adobe, you know, be able to get into that market for sure. So I'm glad to hear them say things like that. Absolutely. So let's look at what operating systems people are running their Cold Fusion server on. Uh, question three on the survey. Now, is this server? Does this question specify if it's a server or just development? This is specifically your server. production server, right? Server. Okay. Yeah, production. Well, it doesn't say production; it just says Cold Fusion server. So um, anyway, most people are running on Windows. Um, and that's no surprise. That's yeah. typically been about seventy percent in the past. Is where that number's yeah. fallen. I yeah, do think Linux has that. come up a bit, to be honest. Yeah, um, we'll have to compare the numbers to see if that's true, but I think you could I'm be curious, right. Yeah, I'm curious how much Docker has played into Linux taking a larger role. Um, you know, well, I've, I've When you're noticed... running Docker, do you care? <laughs> I mean, I well, understand you... underneath it's Linux, but like... Right, well, I mean, cleaner, so, so you, what? you don't care outside of case sensitivity and if your application <laughs> is hard-coded to have Windows file paths in it. But I've, I've worked with quite a few people online switching to mm -hmm. Docker that at the same time, we have clients in the same boat, at the same time make a move from Windows to Linux just because it kind of comes with the Docker package. You can do Docker mm -hmm. on Windows. Almost nobody does it. Nobody mm -hmm. really supports it with official images. So most people moving to Docker are also making a, a Linux transition as well. So that's why I'm curious um, mm -hmm. if Docker has helped push that Linux number a little higher. Yeah, it's a good theory. And Mac, I think, still chugging along at... Uh whatever number that is, 10, less than 10%. 27 Around people. 10%. I'm really curious if those people are actually using Macs for their servers. I, I, I know people do it. It's out there. Um, but maybe they were confused by the question. It was possible. I've only actually talked mm -hmm. to maybe one person I think of that but, I know for certain used Macs for their actual production servers. But we did have a separate question, which is what OS do you run on your laptop PC? Exactly. And, and there, many more people are running Mac. And still, Windows is the dominant uh, OS people. Yeah. And I think that's, 
that's almost a little unique to Confusion. It seems like Macs are, are so prevalent for just developers in general. You know, you go to a developer mm -hmm. conference, um, especially a non-Confusion one, you know, and you look out at the crowd and you just see like thousands of little Apple symbols, you know, all mm -hmm. taunting you from the from the tables. <laughs> um, but Windows has always been very high uh, for Confusion developers. And I'm curious how much of that is maybe just the the effects of government and larger corporate stuff, which tend to be just all windows managed by corporate IT, you know, on that's their development machines. Um, mm. there, there's, there's not that many people developing on Linux. What's, what's the number there? Um, About 30. 10%, 10% yeah. on that and 30% Mac and then 70% uh, uh, windows, something like that. Sounds about right. I mean, I, well, maybe, maybe one day you'll be taunted by penguins out in the crowds. You know, <laughs> I would mind that. I, I do run across Cold Fusion developers on Linux somewhat regularly, typically because mm -hmm. they had the, the weirdest problems with command box on their machines mm -hmm. and the versions of Java they have. So I, I hear from them, but. All right. Very interesting. Well, let's move on to question five, which is what browser client platforms do you support in your apps? So all kinds of possibilities here. Uh, Chrome, of course, is the one that nearly everyone supports. Firefox is not far behind. IE is actually a fair chunk uh, so behind, maybe 80%. Yeah, we have Edge as a separate question, though it's nearly as high as IE. Well, Edge and IE are sort of, you know, isn't Edge quite a bit different from legacy IE? Or? I, I believe it is underneath. Um, yeah. what, what's interesting about this question is a lot of people there, there are companies that explicitly say like, we don't support X. If you use it, you're mm -hmm. screwed. Uh, but you don't typically see that. A lot of times, most companies with a, with a web-based application out there, um, you know, are gonna support in general, whatever the users are using, as long as it's not something just totally from underneath the rock. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Which anybody- of these browsers under the rock? <laughs> yeah, so, well, I mean, none of them really. Uh, I don't, of course, the other option, I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, I, I mean, what, so yeah. I'm curious, anybody who didn't check Opera or oh, didn't check that, Safari or didn't check this. Edge, oh, Vivaldi, Valdi, didn't he write Safari Four Seasons? <laughs> yeah, well, Great. apparently he's a browser. So I, I'm uh, curious if people who didn't check some of these options, like actually mm -hmm. refuse to support it. Like, you know, user calls mm -hmm. in, hey, I'm trying to give you my money and I'm trying to go through your shopping cart, but you know, Opera isn't working. I mean, do they really mm -hmm. say, well, screw you, go, you know, go install Chrome if you want to buy my products. Um, mm. I, I know it's out there. It probably doesn't play out with those exact words, but I'm curious about that. I mean, typically when yeah. you're working in, at least when I've worked at companies well, like, who sell yeah. things, you know, if, if a mm -hmm. customer calls in and they're like, shut up and take my money, I'm using random browser one, two, three, you know, the, the, the business is like, we got to support this browser and we got to get this money. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see this graph. Well, and I think there's a difference between would you accept someone running Opera on your website and do you bother to test for it? Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Do you bother to test for it? I mean, it might be like Chrome 99%. The only thing we bother testing, right? <laughs> right. I've definitely seen that where it's like, yeah, we'll support whatever, but if it works in Chrome, I assume it works everywhere. Uh, I mean, yeah, I've been which isn't by that. always true. Yeah, no, that isn't always not. true. I've, I've definitely run into that issue myself. And then a fair chunk of people are uh, supporting uh, iOS or Android mobile browsers. So. See, I use uh -huh. Chrome on my Android phone. And from what I've seen, it always seems to behave a decent amount like Chrome on my desktop. I don't know what I hit all the edge cases, but it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Well, let's go down to databases. Another controversial question. People are always happy to argue about what database they use. Um, looks like the winner is Microsoft SQL Server. That's da, 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 da. not surprising. It isn't, particularly as Actually, they, you can basically use it for free now, you know, on a lower end. So oh, yeah, and you can run it on, on Docker as well. Mm. For free on Docker, really? Um, I don't know, but yeah, I think you can run Express because we, uh, yeah. we have some clients that use SQL Server and we use Docker Compose so we can spin mm. up Elasticsearch and, and Adobe Cold mm -hmm. Fusion and SQL Server. Um, and you can spin it up on Linux as part of a Docker container. Um, mm. That's pretty nice. Now it's interesting, I mean, access, bless his heart, is still just hanging on. How many, how many people, what's the number? It's oh, about eight, eight, eight percent. Souls. 
Yeah, you well, poor brave you know, souls. You can what's, still get a driver for it if you try. I mean, it doesn't what's, come with... What's the things. internet meme? You know, the rent is too dang high. We need to have one that's like, you know, the number of access users is too dang high. <laughs> no, I'm just giving uh, you know, access people I mean, a hard obviously time. Obviously, it has, has issues if you want to have high number of people coming to the site. But, you know, if it's a small site, it can still work. Um, but you know, why not use MySQL, which is free and much more scalable, you know, which is the second one. Yeah. Most so I mean, Oracle's day. coming in third and obviously nobody's running their blog on Oracle. Um, I hope not. Oracle doesn't have a, fr- does Oracle have a free version? I can't, no, think no, I don't do. think so. I don't think so. Last time I looked, Oracle costs like 40 grand per CPU core to something ridiculous. But, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, when I work with it, it's always usually a government client. Um, yeah. So and then uh, honestly, there's a lot of other other databases, MariaDB and MongoDB, Postgres. Yeah, and MariaDB, of course, being a fork of MySQL. Um, yeah. I'm almost a little surprised Maria didn't catch up as much. A lot of times, sometimes in in the open source community, you have a you know you have a product, it gets bought out by someone. The original developers are like, "Ah, this is crap. Let's fork and do our own thing." And a lot of times, the fork will kind of take off, and everyone will forget about the original one. Like Jenkins did that. It used to be called Hudson. You know. Um, mm-hmm. In this case, you no know, MySQL being bought up by uh, by the Oracle Corporation, they still seem to manage to uh, to keep a lot of uh, a lot of market share, even though the original mm-hmm. MySQL developers all moved over to MariaDB. Um, mm-hmm. It's interesting to see. Well, maybe when Oracle start charging for MySQL, that will suddenly change. So. Now, I see progress. At first, I thought that said PostgreSQL, but it actually says progress. I'd never oh, heard of that the hot- one. Yeah, I wonder if that's a typo or if there really is one like that. No, very few. One percent of people we say they're using it. Check so. on that. So oh, is, is PostgreSQL third? No, I think it's coming in behind MariaDB. I think it's slightly yeah, it's less. Yeah, behind MariaDB. Yeah. You know, so. people that lo- that use PostgreSQL always seem to love it. I mean, anybody ever, mm-hmm. I ever talked to who uses Postgres just absolutely adores it. I'm almost a little surprised it doesn't have more usage. But um. It's interesting. I, I, yeah, and just speaking of, I can't remember if we have a question on what uh, Java engine people are running, but you know, Oracle's been messing around with you know the licensing on that Java engine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have to like buy a license, and then they wouldn't for a long time. For like six months, it was really hard to even buy it from them. It's kind of the opposite. Are you talking about the support for Oracle JDK? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you phone up. You'd we'd have customers phone them up, and they couldn't even buy the thing that they said they you had to really? buy. I mean, yeah. I'm 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 well. I'm very aware of the license changes that happened there, but yeah. I haven't actually worked with anybody who actually tried to purchase the the support for Oracle JDK. So that's interesting. I think Larry Ellison must have been out for a sushi lunch or something, and just wasn't <laughs> making any sales. I, I I spent all my time diving into the uh, the Open JDK variants, so. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Somebody says want to use MongoDB, but not sure how yet. Hmm. Interesting. All right, and then a bunch of other things like Teradata, and I don't want to call Solar a database. <laughs> Whoever filled that in, hmm. Fox Pro is clearly a database. Oh, Azure SQL database. That's uh, kind of yeah. a cloud run, scalable I, SQL server. We played. I run, that. I've run across a few people uh, using Azure. Yeah. All right. I think we should move on to question seven on MVC frameworks and which ones do people use or, or if they use a framework at all. All right. So MVC custom homegrown is still on top, uh, which yes. has always been very typical for, uh, for cold fusion. Um, well, just a word to the people who have a custom homegrown model view controller framework, you know, time to smell the uh, cold coffee and get cold box or framework. <laughs> one. You know, you said or it. CF wheels, you know, I mean, that's a, Another yeah. frame. Oh, yeah. CF wheels yeah. is good. Um, obviously, I'm I'm uh, I have a, a dog in this race since I'm part of Team Coldbox. Um, I mean, there are woof, solid woof. numbers. <laughs> yeah, woof, woof. Uh, there are solid numbers using frameworks, but you know, other languages like you know, like Ruby was around as long as Cold Fusion, but it didn't really have its you know surgence, resurgence until Ruby on Rails came out. You know, a, yeah. a lot of other. Uh, languages kind of grow up from the beginning with frameworks that are sort of pushed onto people. You know, Cold Fusion was around in the, in the Wild West days of the web before frameworks were a thing, and a lot of code got written. A lot of people got, you know, indoctrinated into Cold Fusion without frameworks, and there's just a lot of that around. So, I mean, well, Coldbox 
if you ignore the, the custom option, coal box is on top, but fuse box is actually still edged out framework one. I mean, a fuse box obviously hasn't been updated in many years now, but there's a lot of, you know, legacy code out there using it. So that code doesn't use yeah. it go away very quickly. And I haven't checked recently, but like uh, five months ago, I had a customer who was, uh, they, they went to the Fusebox website and the website had disappeared. So, oh. um, well, I did yeah, reach I out to the folks saying, hey, do you want some help with the website? Never heard back. So I kind of. Um, yeah, once a framework kind of dies, um, that, that's the, the, the issue that can happen is, you know, the resources of the docs, the website, you know, it yeah. doesn't really always have someone to look after it. Um, well, I think, but somewhere, somewhere in the cold fusion community, we can find someone to resurrect that because there is a lot of legacy fuse box. You could. Well, there. I mean, honestly, if if someone doesn't want to manage, you know, a site, you can get, you know, a GitHub page, a GitHub wiki mm -hmm. to put your content mm -hmm. on, and you don't have to even, you know, pay for it. Uh, hey, so, yeah. I mean, there there are a lot of just completely free options out there for mm -hmm. you know an open source project to live, and no one really has to worry about keeping a domain registered. Um, I, don't know. I mean, the, the takeaway for me is is avoid frameworks that are <laughs> that are dead or not actively developed, you know, and uh, and you know work on the unusing frameworks yeah. that have an active community around them. Yeah, uh, maybe framework... we need a bit more effort on migration guide from Fusebox to Coldbox or to Framework One or to CF Wheels. Yeah, or... I wrote a blog post on migrating Fusebox to Coldbox. Oh. Um, if you give us the link later, we'll stick it into the show notes. Yeah, it was um, actually a whole series I blogged a couple of years ago. Oh. I think the big thing that keeps people away is just the enormity of the task. You know, people have very large sites heavily mm. invested into something like Fusebox. And it's just not something that, mm. that they want to dig into. Yeah. CMSs. Well, <coughs> yeah, question eight. What ColdFusion CMS content management system do you use? So most popular so the one. The majority of respondents is, say nothing. Don't use one. Don't use a CMS. <laughs> well, and that could but be custom is next, or it could be they haven't thought about it. But custom is a really popular one, and then uh, Mura is the top. Um, uh, yeah, what, I was going to say surprise. commercial, but it, it's open source. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Mura and actually several of these I think all have professional support. Um, you know, Content Box does, uh, producer yeah. contents does. I want to say Common Spot. Yeah. Um, Common Spot absolutely does because it's a paid commercial CMS. Yeah, yeah. And then Preside um, you know, is I've, open source. Yes, and that's professionally supported as well through Pixelate. Um, and that's actually yeah. very actively developed as well. Uh, I mean, Preside yeah. is written in Coldbox, so I have a, a soft spot for it, even though Content Box is obviously, um, you know, one of the products I work with. Um, I mean, the, the Preside guys are super active on that. They do a lot of work on it. Now, mm -hmm. I do believe it only runs on Lucy. It takes advantage of a lot of underlying mm -hmm. Lucy things for performance mm -hmm. and for special features. So that, that may uh, be one thing that kind of limits uh, the uptake of Preside. But I've seen a lot of custom-built CMSs in Cold Fusion just in general. I always kind of joke that I think no other language in the, in the world has as many custom CMS implementations <laughs> as, as I've seen in Cold Fusion. But mm. Well, you know, if someone's looking to have content on the site, I think it makes sense to use a third-party content. Yeah, and, and a lot team. of them, a lot of the CMSs I've seen are fairly simple. You know, it may just be yeah. a database table called, you know, content, and they have some basic cred editor and an admin and some marketing person stick stuff in. They throw it on the homepage. You know, that's that's the the minimum CMS right there. Yes, and a few other unusual CMSs listed in other. other. Not all those are even cold fusion. I, I know. <laughs> That's why I skipped over them. Uh, all right. Question nine. What JavaScript libraries do you use? So clear winner here is jQuery. Just about everyone on the planet uses jQuery. Yeah, and um, this, this question is difficult because there's only about 8.7 trillion JavaScript libraries in the world. So we kind of pick a handful of them here. It's hard to do about anything without jQuery, but Angular is very high, followed by Vue and then React. Yeah, they're the top That's three. Nice. And then everything else is uh, you know, also ran, really. You know, I see Backbone in there, really small. I remember when Backbone first came out, and at first it seemed like it was going to be just about as popular as everything else, but then it didn't quite catch on. It's a, it's a art and a science as to what makes a framework or a programming language catch on, and maybe that's a... I thought it was Voodoo. Uh, <laughs> it's it could be voodoo maybe you have to if, if it was a science we'd know we'd know how it worked 
Well, I think we should have a separate episode to go into that. Maybe. Uh, I was actually the... talking with um, talking one of the Adobe managers earlier this week about uh, that, and um, you know, it is a bit of a, an art. It's not not just a science. Uh, I was talking with Atish, who's the you know, I guess he's oh, yeah. VP of engineering for Cold Fusion, spacing out on his title. Um, so, whoops, shouldn't be showing that thing on the thing, should I? <laughs> How does this thing work? You want the, the far right the... tab? Yes, but I can't there get to it because the zoom share button was oh. over the tab. <laughs> yeah, you, you can just grab the zoom thing and pull it up. It does that to me. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you yeah, can grab I mean, it and if, move it sideways. Oh, yeah. how clever. See, I learned something new. Right? Yeah. Always happens. Right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always sort of a holy grail as far as, I mean, if we could tell what frameworks would be the popular ones, we'd be able to tell what videos will go viral and what marketing campaigns will work. Mm. Well, maybe that's what the AI revolution will give us, Brad. You know? Oh, geez, don't um, start me on that. <laughs> we better do a separate episode on AI revolution as well. Um, we'll have to ask AI what it thinks. Can you get a yes. quote from AI for the, for the podcast? I, I think we can. Yeah. Um, let's Prototype. move quickly on to CSS frameworks, where I think it's a little less controversial and uh, that's most that's popular what one. Think. That's what I think. Well, 80% of people use bootstrap. How can it be controversial? You see, I'm I'm not a front end guy really. I'm I'm happy to avoid the 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 front end and, and focus on back end and just REST APIs and stuff. So I don't have any dog in this, you know, in this fight. I just kind of sit back and watch people, you know, a fight about it. Uh, okay. But yeah, Bootstrap uh, is definitely a clear winner, uh, followed only by none. Right, none. Yeah. I haven't heard of this is... none framework. You know, yeah, no, it's used it by should... the Catholic Church apparently. <laughs> We should create a framework called none JS or something, you know, oh. and then whenever people answer, we're like, yeah, they're using us, you know, <laughs> we could uh, it way in second place is foundation. And, and then I guess. Nine, skeleton. Six, yeah. I mean, the results are so small. Once you get down there, it's almost relevant. Other unusual. Unify, ones. tailwind, semantic yeah. UI. Actually several semantic yeah. UI ones. Yeah. But, you know, it's still less than 1%. Um, yeah. All right. CFC dependency injection. I, I think that none framework is going to win again. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to fork Wirebox, rename it none, and okay. then it'll be on top every year. Uh, well, yeah, so look, Wirebox is the winner of the frameworks that are used. It um, is. So DI1, which most people using Framework 1 are going to be using DI1. Yeah. I'm curious about the hus the yeah. custom homegrown ones. Yeah, I don't know quite what they're calculating to figure out dependency injection and why they'd bother. You know, if you're going to do dependency injection, then why not use a? It's it's one thing to, to create an object factory, you know, because an object factory to simple is just just a CFC that creates other CFCs or a class that creates other classes. Um, I don't know that I've ever really seen a code base on a client or out there where somebody actually did some sort of like actual dependency injection. Uh, you know, and, and for if anyone's, you know, not using dependency injection, which maybe it's not so silly looking at the size of the none bar, you know, this is for any application that uses any substantial amount of CFCs, you know, and your CFCs need to reference other CFCs, you know, in, in the sort of dirty way, it's just to create them all and throw them in the application scope, or just create fresh instances every time you want them. But, you know, your, your dependency injection framework like Wirebox or DI1, you know, abstracts the work of creating those for you. Uh, as well as passing references around so they can kind of build out your CFC instances with all the other services or DAOs they need. Um, Definitely makes life easier to use. Oh, absolutely. A, a I, to do this. I could, and, and I couldn't it's not write. like Wirebox costs a lot. You know, <laughs> you know it's free. I mean, it's I, free. I couldn't imagine writing a, an app of any, of any relative size without dependency injection. And when you get into like the cold box space, you know, dependency injection and Wirebox is absolutely integral to how things like modules work. Uh, you know, you mm -hmm. install a module, you just drop it in the modules folder, and then you can just magically ask Wirebox for things from that module, and it just goes and finds them automatically. You know, hey, Wirebox, give me the XYZ service for my module. Um, no, you, you can't do that with, uh, in a world without dependency injection, so. Mm. 
makes sense. So wire boxes, uh, wire boxes, honestly, probably one of the most important. I now, should say dependency injection in general, but mm -hmm. in the box world, wire box is probably one of the most pivotal libraries. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's used, it's kind of the core of everything. Even command mm -hmm. box uses wire box internally. Um, right. Anyway, I think to be fair to the nuns, maybe they're not even doing object oriented programming. So well, that, that's a good, that's a good question. Are, are people in the nun category not really utilizing CFCs? Um, yeah. Cause if, if they not, might, there they might, might not be a need. They might be using CFCs, but not as objects. You know, they kind of use it as a fancy function container. Well, or they may just be using them just as always transients with, with no real references. I've, I've seen a fair amount of code, customer code that just use kind of like, you know, CF and vote calls everywhere. And every time they ever reference a CFC, it's always just kind of a on the fly, you know, transient uh, creation as part of a CF and vote. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no real like persistent, uh, persistence of CFC objects that are being passed around. And so they, you know, they get away without using any of that. Well, let's move on to persistent frameworks. Talking yes. persistence. And again, none is the winner. <laughs> of course, maybe they're just not doing persistent. <laughs> but uh, second is uh, Hibernate. Uh, and then uh, some people have a homegrown thing and uh, Cobox, Seaborn module, CF yeah. Reels, ORM. Persistence is... It, seems to vary greatly kind of based on the language. Um, I, know I mentioned some some languages kind of grow up with frameworks that were just always pushed from the beginning. Uh, you know, like Ruby, for instance, almost you know every Ruby app you come across, Ruby on Rails, is going to be using you know, ORM because it's kind of just like an inherent baked in part of what everybody uses. Um, you know, in the Cold Fusion space, we didn't see, uh, you know, Hibernate until Cold Fusion 9. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of applications that got their start before ORM was ever a thing. And it definitely has a bit of a bad name uh, with some people, you know, dislike for ORM, either on a philosophical level, if you will, to just dislike for the number of bugs or the performance of it. Um, so ORM has always lagged. Now, we didn't, we don't have Quick on here, but depending on, Quick is fairly new. Uh, Quick, Quick is a, is a new, well, oh, oh, there we go. 1% of people use Quick. So yeah, Quick is, is a new project that Eric Peterson, who's part of Ordis, has been working on for, I'm not going to throw a date out because I'll be wrong, but it's still fairly new. It is built on top of QB or Query Builder, um, and it's just a pure Cold Fusion based ORM. Uh, it's very functional as far as using closures and things, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not at the level of um, functionality of, say, Hibernate, which is just a, you know, a behemoth um, written in Java, but anyway... Interesting to see that. Well, let's move on to question 13, lucky for some. Uh, testing and mocking frameworks. And yes, none is winning again. But of those who do use one, TestBox is the winner. Right. Yeah. And I assume that the people saying none probably aren't, just aren't doing any testing, which, I mean, is a very large number of, of people. Luis always likes to say that, you know, half the, half the people in ColdFusion aren't testing and the other half are lying. <laughs> <laughs> They well, say I, they're I, using I test hear, box. I hear if you get a million monkeys to try out your app, eventually they'll find the bugs, right? <laughs> or just a million users. Heck, 100 users will find the bugs. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting. This graph, first of all, everything isn't necessarily in direct competition with each other. Selenium, for instance, is, uh, is not, doesn't really do the same thing test box does. So there's probably a, a fair amount of overlap. People using Selenium are likely using test box. You know, mock box is more of a, a subset of test box, right? You use mock box alongside test box. Now MX unit is specifically sort of a, an alternative to test box, if you will. Right. But it um, isn't maintained it, anymore. Oh. Yeah. MX unit hasn't been maintained for a while. If you look at the repo, there's a handful of pull requests that'll come in, but you know, the last several years has been a few pull requests here and there. Uh, test box 3.0 actually came out last month into the box. Uh, so it's a very active, uh, framework i, I, think I remember could, someone gave a detailed talk on that i forget his name now am i some ugly it guy wasn't it brad yeah <laughs> uh i think rocket unit uh is not the one that comes with cf wheels is that right yeah, yeah there we go cf wheels yeah. built in so presumably yeah. those users are, are on cf wheels naturally yeah. well anyone listening who isn't doing uh writing test cases and uh check out test box because uh, oh, again, it's so not, not expensive. We should. Uh, I just recorded a screencast on this this week. It'll be published soon. Mm. Testbox 3.0 also has 
code coverage functionality, which is really brand new in the cold fusion space. Um, and, yeah, you, uh, that's what you gave the talk on, right? We using I the did. Reactor yeah, we worked, and we worked with Fusion Reactor. Uh, so it works in conjunction with a Fusion Reactor, a licensed Fusion Reactor installation on your server. And what code coverage means is you run your test, your unit test, your integration test, and then TestBox will actually generate a report that tells you every single file in your application um, at a line by line basis, what lines were executed as part of your test and what lines were not executed. And you can see where those missing gaps are in your unit test. So that's, that's a super fun uh, functionality. That's a great that thing out. to do. So you can find out where you need to add tests. Or oh where yeah, it was sort of addicting. Yeah, you, you, you turn that puppy on and you're like, oh man, I didn't even call this function. And you're like, I'm gonna go write a test now. So I can, <laughs> so I can test this untested function. It's, you know, I I was talking to um, Shoresh uh, Adobe, and do you know how many test cases they have in their test suite? For well, I've for heard it's thousands, forty thousand tests. Forty thousand. That's, That's a, a lot of tests. Apparently, yes. every time they get a bug, they have to write a new test to like prove that bug really has been squashed and can't. Well, that's exactly how you should here. do it. Uh, yeah. Lucy, Lucy's server does the same thing, uh, except for it's all just visible on GitHub. Every single bug that comes into Jira, as it's triaged, a failing test case is written that demonstrates the bug, and then the ticket doesn't pass until the until the test passes. Uh, so I would, I would I would hope Adobe does the same thing. Obviously, that yeah. way you don't you know have a, a regression in the future where yes. the, the bug pops back. Yeah, you don't want to play whack a mole with your bugs. <laughs> sure. So Let's mobile frameworks. The, uh, yeah, PhoneGap is the uh, one. We didn't have none here. We had not doing mobile, which made yeah. more. So accurate. we didn't even include CF Client, did we? No. Scroll down. Anybody um, write it in? Um, people wrote in quite a few things, but no. Uh, yeah, React Native. React yeah. Native. I'll, we should we should include that. It looks like next year. Yeah. We're always Honestly, improving the survey. <laughs> there's not there's not a huge amount of spread. I mean, so PWA, Progressive Web Apps, I mean, that, that's a way you can make your website behave like you have a mobile app, but it's really just a website. You know, perfect didn't example. Didn't you guys, is, didn't Gavin do that for the Yeah, into the box so into, into the box, yeah. if you went to schedule.intothebox.org, it's just a web page, but it has that special manifest file that makes it a Progressive Web App, as they say. And so your, your phone browser sees that and gives you a little option to add it to your home screen. So you get an icon in your home screen that when you tap will open up inside of kind of a, a headless web browser with fully cached data. Uh, it's just basically a web page. And so that saved us a ton of time because we didn't have to compile actual native mobile apps for Android and for iOS and for Windows and get those approved and onto the app stores. We just, uh, Gavin literally made our progressive web app front of the box like two days before the conference threw it out there on the internet and it's just a website. Don't but tell it, anyone. It was done months <laughs> ahead of time. Yeah. But you know, it has caching capabilities as offline capabilities. And I see a lot of people moving to that. We, we know when mobile yeah, phones see? first came out, browsers mm -hmm. were crappy, right? You didn't have offline storage and everybody ran to make apps. And now it's kind of like browsers and the progressive web apps have caught up. If all your app is, is a mobile version of your website, you can make a progressive web app. So it's, it was very interesting. But other than that, there's not a huge spread here as far as a, a super clear winner other than the, the none. Yeah. You know, phone gap yeah. is on top followed by Cordova, but it's still not a massive, you know, nobody's really out in the, in the lead. Yeah. And they're I'm all honestly about surprised. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised to still see as much native Android and native iOS. Um, so, some people think it gives you performance edge or maybe a features edge. You know? It might, I uh, suppose it, it depends on the app you're writing, right? If I was to write a yeah. game, Sure. If yeah. I'm going to write an app that's basically just lets you, you know, file an insurance claim just like your website does. I don't know if that matters, but yeah. anyway, that's probably more of a religious war there, but uh, still interesting. All right. What CF features do you use for code reuse? All right. Well, clear winner here is CFCs. Basically, everyone uses CFCs. Well, so what about those people not using dependency injection? No excuse! <laughs> well, like we said earlier, they're probably not writing object-oriented code. They're just you sticking yeah. common code into CFCs because it's convenient. You know? I agree. Yeah, it's fine. more like a glorified CF include file, which I mean, yeah. if, with if it works, that's yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Uh, but speaking of CF includes, they're, they're the second most popular. Custom tags are still being used by a lot of people. Surprising. I haven't used and custom used tags in a long time. 
I mean, I well, think it everybody... kind of clever. Uses. It's kind of cute to have a, a new tag that you just stick into the page and does useful things. <laughs> it's kind of cute. The one thing I liked about custom tags is how easily you could nest um, things inside mm -hmm. of itself. You know, if you mm -hmm. had a, some sort of like hierarchy interface that needed to kind of recursively work. Um, you know, in the cold box world, I would just use render view, which is essentially a CF include at the end of the day. Um, custom tags were nice though, in that they encapsulated the variable scope inside of them, uh, which, you know, pre CFCs was one of the only ways you could get something reusable that didn't kind of just spill all its variables out into the main page. Um, mm. but anyway, I'm kind of curious why, you know, why people are using use defined functions versus just sticking their functions in CFCs. Uh, maybe maybe hmm. that's confusion on the answers. I mean, is there any benefit to doing it the old way that I'm missing here? I don't know. I have to see what people meant by that. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, maybe they sort of meant they were using functions in CFCs because isn't there another way you can do UDFs? You stick them somewhere else. I'm, well, I'm yeah, I mean, you could just... It, it, you could just stick a UDF anywhere in the page and, and call it. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of apps that I see that are older, they use application.cfm, right? You know, they would just have like a big old fat CF include in the application.cfm that would just include mm -hmm. a giant file full of just all sort of utility functions. And then those mm -hmm. would just live in the variable scope and would just flow through just the entire app mm -hmm. and they would just kind of call them from everywhere. Um, I will say debugging applications like that gets incredibly tricky because there's mm -hmm. like zero encapsulation. Everything just kind of floats around in the variable scope, but that is, that is pretty common. Um, you know, I mean, it's the, it's quick and dirty for sure. It's sort of like a cold fusion function orgy, really. <laughs> if you say so. Yeah. Instead of having a private room for every function, you just stick them all into the same room and hope they don't, you know, yeah. mess each other up. I mean, it, if they're all sort of quote unquote static in sense and don't need to, you know, mutate state, they all just do something. I mean, I suppose that works, but yeah, that's, um, it's definitely not very organized though. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. We should go on to source code control, a controversial question in previous years. Um, but hopefully by now, most people are doing source control. And uh, where's, like where's the none? True. None don't is uh, oh, about 8%. Go. And I think also, to be honest, uh, zip up folders and um, there's another one, copy directories is sort of very, they're, they're the kissing cousins that, of none. That, yeah, that's not source control. Now, there's, there can be value in it. And heck, I've done those right in the past. Um, that's more of a backup strategy. Um, yeah. You know, when you think of source control, you think of like automated diffs between two versions, blame, who touched this line on what date with what commit message, revert my change, you know, with a single line of, of command line, you know, switch between branches. You know, these are features of source controls. So zipping up your files will let you go, oh, crap, what was this file last week? Manual, 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 right? Um, but it's, it's definitely not really full on source control. Um, but the winner winner on this is uh, GitHub. That's the most. So do we one. see? Don't we have? Don't we have Git as an option outside of GitHub? Or do we not? No. Oh wait, what's self-hosted? Yeah, GitLab, GitHub, and what's GitHub the first right? option that says self-hosted but a stop dot dot? Git self-hosted. There we go. Self-hosted Git repo like Git. See, even so, Bitbucket can be Git or Mercurial. But honestly, self-hosted Bitbucket, GitLab, and GitHub are really all probably Git in general, using, you know, Git source control. It's just different ways you can do it. GitHub obviously is, you know, a specific website that offers Git repos. GitLab, you know, is is still using Git, but via a different sort of product. I think Git yeah. is definitely on top. I mean, Bitbucket, we don't know how many of those people are using Mercurial, but most people I know of on Bitbucket are using Git. Um, yeah. So and then really that's... Versions. This yeah. pretty far in the behind of Git, I would say at this point. I mean, Subversion was on top back in the day before Git kind of kind of came out. So I mean, I, yeah. I I I work with a couple clients that still use Subversion. I mean, I don't mind it. it. It does what I need. Obviously, it has some significant architectural differences between Git. Um, I really really prefer Git anything I'm publishing to the world. You know, with GitHub, the idea of forking remotes. I think as far as superior, um, as far as clients I work with that just have a local subversion repo and it's just an internal website. I mean, I don't mind subversion one bit. It does everything I need. Um, but yeah. 
Do, do, do. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of write-ins it. here. Azure repositories. Never even yeah. used that. Yeah. Dropbox yeah. is another kissing cousin, I think, of zip folders. Well, as someone, some people list Google Drive as a source code control yeah, thing. And I, I guess it does keep a history, but it doesn't let you merge things and see what's changed. So. Yeah, it's it's more of a backup strategy, I think, which has yeah. value, but it's not it's not true source control. All right, let's go to the tools IDEs. Something that people always like to argue about, it seems. Oh, and it looks yes. like we have a uh, uh, upset new winner last Visual year. Studio Sublime, Code. Sublime Text was the winner, but now Visual Studio Code. VS like Code has really picked up quickly. It, it's been around longer than I thought it had. I just didn't really hear it. But once I first heard about VS Code, it seems like it really skyrocketed. But I don't, I mean, people, there's a lot of people who wrote plugins for Sublime for Cold Fusion and CFML. We had Cold Box plugins and things like that. I, I believe it was written in Python. Um, but VS Code really seemed to just have a bunch of people that jumped on it writing CFML and ColdFusion extensions for it, um, which I think is pretty cool and I think helped contribute to it to it taking off. You know, uh, VS Code has a pretty good CFML support. There's cold box extensions, there's command box extensions, there's test box extensions, there's CF length extensions, there's CF... Actually, I don't think... I don't know if we have CF format baked in or not, uh, but there's, there's quite a bit of stuff there. Um, and it's really taken off. Um, Notepad plus plus bless his heart's in third place. <sighs> yeah, it's a nice text editor. You know, a lot of these other things like BB Edit, Ultra Edit, TextPad, they're all nice text editors. They all, you is, know, you is, is Nano on the list? I don't see Nano here. Maybe it's you know, if I down. if I SSH into a production, you know, Docker container, yeah. and I got to debug something on the fly. It's Nano all the way, man. Oh. <laughs> And then, you know, we've got Cold Fusion uh, Builder, CF Eclipse, CF Studio. Cold Fusion Builder is beneath Dreamweaver. Yeah. So I, I heard some very interesting rumors recently. Uh, I, I think Andrew Davis was talking about it on the Modernize or Die podcast. Um, at one of the road shows, I thought there was some, some rumblings or grumblings uh, of potentially Adobe maybe uh, doing some official support for VS Code. You know, they've always kind of hunkered down behind Cold Fusion Builder. Um, and I know it has a decent amount of usage, but it's it's really there's not that many people that use Cold Fusion Builder. Uh, I mean, I still use it fairly regularly, but it's because I'm a bump on a log and I hate to change stuff. I've been forcing myself over to VS Code. Um, but I, I would love to, be, to see Adobe put some official work into things like VS Code. You know, uh, like Cold Fusion Builder is kind of big. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in Cold Fusion Builder, right? You know, some of the security scanning was in there. The CF client was baked in, which I don't really think was for the better. Um, you know, they had the whole extension capability, which was a cool idea. Um, I, I think CLIs have largely replaced that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of Cold Fusion developers not using Cold Fusion Builder. Um, you know, and the community's done a good job of filling in the gaps there. But I'd love to see Adobe have some semblance of an official module you know, that does, or extension that does proper code formatting and stuff. So I think that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, you know, people have written Cold Fusion support for visual uh, studio code. So maybe the Lucy folks will do more on it and that'll encourage Adobe to do the same. I, mm, yeah. So. I wouldn't hold your breath for that, but at least, <laughs> at least not Lucy proper. Um, yeah. Definitely. Lucy and I have heard, from, you know, some that. people, people who do more design stuff as well as cold fusion, they still like using Dreamweaver for the design stuff. And, um, yeah. you know, you can still add cold fusion support into Dreamweaver if you try hard enough. Um, I used Dreamweaver for a while between when I, between CF studio, cold fusion studio and builder, I used Dreamweaver for, for a few years. Mm. Isn't brackets an Adobe product? I've always wondered why the cold fusion team didn't work something with brackets to get, you know, really good cold fusion support. Um, yeah, mystery to me. Um, okay, browser development tools. Uh, See, I think this. I think this question is probably more of an artifact of what browser mm. do you develop in? Because whatever the browser people develop in, I, I assume they yeah. probably use whatever the developer tools are in that browser. I develop yeah. in Chrome typically, so I use the Chrome developer tools because that's what's sitting there in front of me. Yeah. Um, Firebug is interesting. Uh, because Firebug was like a separate sort of extension for Firefox, if I recall, back before Firefox kind of got, you know, its own 
built into bugging stuff kind of as a first class citizen. So it's interesting to see if people are still out there using Firebug and if that's actually really like a, a third party thing they're installing or if by Firebug, Firebug, they just potentially meant, you know, the built in Firefox debugging. Yeah, it's a, it's a mystery. Um... All right, REST APIs question 19. We're nearly halfway through at this point. Finally getting to the good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> REST. Homegrown is the most popular one, closely followed by I don't use REST. Or Fair. I do REST, but I don't use Cold Fusion to do it in. <laughs> 18 people. So Homegrown's yeah. the winner, followed by I don't <laughs> use REST. So it looks right. like, is Taffy on top or is it Coldbox? They look pretty neck and neck. They're pretty neck and neck there. I think oh, Coldbox wins winner by, by a one. Winner by a photo finish. Ooh. Yeah. So Taffy is a, is a very good library, but I mean, it's obviously very targeted. It does just rest. Um, there's a lot of people that use that. You know, Coldbox does rest, like, you know, in addition to the other, you know, 500 things it provides. So I think some people looking just to add rest into legacy um, definitely are, are it looks easier just to drop in Taffy. It's not quite as much of a, a commitment. Um, you know, CF Wheels has its own REST. Um, now, the CF built-in REST, what's the number on that? That's actually higher than I expected. Uh, about 15%. Folks wow. It, it gets a, a decently bad rap in some of the community stuff. Um, I've used the built-in CF REST in both Adobe and Lucy and generally hated it the entire time I had to touch it. Um, <laughs> But I mean, for, I'm also coming, you know, with a, a bit of a biased uh, opinion, you know, yeah, being yeah. part of the Coldbox project, you know, and we had this yeah. very full featured REST implementation that's been out there for years that does everything. It's modular, logging, caching, you know, and then Adobe comes along and they kind of do their own REST, but it's like a, a small subset of functionality of what you get in like a full MVC framework, you know, and I'm kind of like, why? Like, why do you even bother? Just like, you know, let the community projects that are like super mature, you know, be the solution for this. But I don't, I don't necessarily think the vendors should try to do everything sometimes. I know that's a, a, yeah. a big feature of Cold Fusion, which I love, but sometimes I kind of wish they wouldn't, <laughs> I kind of wish they wouldn't try to do everything sometimes, you know, like they, they make, they make hard things easy, but sometimes there's already like amazingly easy community libraries. And I think they should just get behind those. Um, well, just now I it just creates agree, more fragmentation. I'd agree, yeah, I'd agree with that from a different point of view, which is for a language to be strong, you need a strong ecosystem of third-party add-ins. And if you're always kind of copying the features of third-party add-ins and sticking them into the main product, it, it's basically screwing around with the third-party market. Yeah. Oh. See, one of the great things about the community, at least if, if a project is actively maintained, if you find a bug in a built-in feature in Cold Fusion, um, how long will it take to get a patch for that? If it's not a high priority, I mean, bugs can sit around for years before they see a patch. And if you're on an older version of, you know, of Cold Fusion, it may never get fixed. You know, if, if I fix a bug in Coldbox today, there'll be a snapshot build out there for you to install via command box in as long as it takes Travis CI to run. So about 10 minutes later, you can install the bleeding edge of Coldbox and you can get that patch. So, you know, the community ecosystem, whether it's Taffy or Framework One or Coldbox, you know, have the ability to iterate patches and new fixes on a very fast timetable uh, without and, needing and if, an entire for any, update for it. If for any reason you were busy doing something else, it's open source, so they could fix the code themselves if they really had to. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a lot of pull requests that happen with Taffy and Coldbox and Framework One. I mean, I love that. That really helps stretch the community. So anyway, Preside, I see Preside several in the right ends. Preside has its own kind of REST framework that's built on top of the, the, the cold box REST. Um, that's pretty cool. It is. All right, question 20. Which caching solutions are you using? And oh, I think none is wins again. <laughs> Not everybody uh, uses caching, but. No. But, so what do uh, we have then? EH cache, the built in cold fusion cache. Uh, that's not too surprising. I mean, it, cause it's, it's downright easy and it works. Um, you know, you have Adobe Cold Fusion, you want to cache something, you just use cache put, cache get, bada bing, bada boom, you know, you're caching stuff. Um, you know, obviously the built-in EH cache is in process, uh, which I think is the biggest problem with it, meaning you restart your server, you wipe it all out. You know, it's not distributed across a cluster, uh, but it is just super easy to work, uh, to use for sure. And then uh, looks like uh, Cashbox uh, is the 
Yeah. Know, so I'm I'm on. curious about Cashbox because you know Cashbox has a built-in in-memory cache, but it's also a cache aggregator which has providers that can point anywhere. So you could be using Cashbox to point to Memcached or to point to Couchbase. So I'm curious how many of those Cashbox respondents are also using Cashbox as a gateway, if you will, to some external caching provider. Um, mm. Yeah, that's one. Redis of Redis has a decent groups. So, I mean, the same the same thing I just said about Cashbox is true of the Rilo and Lucy caches. Uh, Lucy has a built-in memory RAM cache, which is really not recommended for production, in my opinion. Um, but for the most part, the Lucy caching thing is very much like Cashbox. It's just an, uh, an aggregator. We've got these pluggable providers that point to some external caching engine, such as Memcached or Couchbase or Redis. Redis. So a lot of people using the, the Lucy cache checkbox are probably using something like Memcached, you know, behind it that it connects to. Um, and that's an amazing feature, in my opinion, of Lucy that you don't get in Adobe Cold Fusion is the ability to, uh, to have that built-in engine level kind of providers that point to those external caches. And you can funnel your cache gate, your cache put functions, your query caching, all to that external, external resource. All right, let's look at how much experience Cold Fusion developers have. How many years have they been using it? Question 21, and uh, biggest one is 15 years or more, followed not very closely by 10 to 15. And yeah, then we've got a few folks coming in new, but... Um, yeah, and I'm I always interested in those, those recent groups, one to two years, three to five years, because mm -hmm. that's really where the Cold Fusion community struggles, um, is getting you know, fresh people in. Uh, there was a, a guy I met at the end of the box conference who uh, was from Canada, he's a Cold Fusion developer, and he came down, and he had just started in the last year or two. You know, he got a mm -hmm. job somewhere, they're using Cold Fusion, and he learned it. Um, and I think it's great just to see people like that and talk to them. Um, cause typically speaking, you have a bunch of, you know, old farts like myself, you know, they've been doing this forever and we don't get a lot of new people in. So this is always one of the most, you know, troubling graphs, if you will, in that regard. Well, I, I think it, we need to do more work as a community to, to get cold fusion out in high schools and in, uh, universities. Um, you know, I was looking through a college uh, you know, a two year college, uh, whatever syllabus. And they list all these other languages, PHP, Ruby, Java, you know, you know, they'd be happy to teach cold fusion if someone had a course and just came in and taught it, you know? So, yeah. And there are materials out there. I mean, learn CF in a week is open source. You can use that anywhere you want. Uh, there's an Adobe syllabus that's a little outdated, but still, you know, works. Um, so, um, and you know, if you're in an education thing, you can get free copies of Adobe Cold Fusion for all the students and the teacher, or you can use mm -hmm. Lucy. So, uh, Michael Borden has also been putting out some good training stuff, um, mm. in the community as well in the last month or so, uh, trying to get more, you know, modern, uh, modern, um, guides and things for people to learn Cold Fusion, which is good as well. I'll have to ask him about that. I saw he did a blog post recently about popularity of programming languages, um, mm -hmm. where, yeah, he has a whole uh, series um, he's doing right now on continuous integration, which mm -hmm. was chosen as the result of a poll he put out saying, what would you guys like to learn, uh, mm. learn the most? Right. Let's look at how many years people used object orientation. So a chunk of people have been using it for 10 plus years. Um, not many nuns here. Um, and people have started picking it up in the last five years, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this seems to mirror the previous graph, just slightly smaller mm -hmm. bars. Yeah, I think so. I think most people starting with Cold Fusion now probably pick up some OO stuff. I think so. And if you're using any kind of framework, it's, it's typically something you have to do. Um, Speaking of other languages, what other languages and environments do people use? And this is an incredibly long set of answers because there's so many languages out there I, I don't know how many programming languages there are these days is it 200 or oh, i don't even yeah. know idea you don't know this, Quite is, sort a of lot. A, this is sort of like a, a bucket list question or kitchen sink question yeah. it kind of just throws everything i mean but obviously the most popular answer is javascript which you know many full stack developers are going to use yeah i mean as web developers i don't think that should be surprising at all it looks like i mean ajax is in there but i mean 
Ajax is just using, you know, JavaScript to make HTTP calls. That's really hardly even a technology. It looks like Java, I think, is really the next closest, followed by yeah. Node. No, no, PHP, yeah. I think. Yeah, PHP, then Node.js, Python. Decent amount of Python. C Sharp. Uh, Those are people coming from .NET. .NET. Yeah. No when, super big surprises. I mean, there's, yeah. I see, you know, people out there doing COBOL, Go, Groovy, Grails. Well, 2% of people doing COBOL. Yeah. And say it was that's a lot. bigger than, was bigger than Clockcha, so. <laughs> CGI is actually higher than the COBOL. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost surprised I don't see more closure, um, uh, Grails and Groovy just being, or even Kotlin, you know, being other JVM languages, you would think they would be more, uh, more natural to people already on a JVM language, but. Yeah. And I don't see Scalar listed at all here. Maybe it got listed down in the write-ins. No, no. no. Power Builder. There we go. Oh yeah. <laughs> I used to work at a company with a Power Builder app. Mm. Yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's look at how many Cold Fusion developers are in different people's organizations. Mo most people answering had two to five developers, which is nice. It means you've got a team. Um, second number is just one developer, which... Wow. You so know, that means... So what percentage is that? 20%. Uh, so they, one in five Cold Fusion developers basically work by themselves. Yeah. Well, not necessarily by themselves. They may be in a company, but no one else does Cold Fusion. Well, yeah, they're, they're the, the lone developers. See, I think that's where some of these community resources like CFML Slack and stuff have really been good for people because I see people come on there and say, oh, wow, it's great to be able to bounce ideas off people and ask questions because, you know, I'm the only Cold Fusion person in my job and I don't have people to, to discuss these things with. So, um, yeah, definitely valuable to be able to share questions and things. So what's the, what do we have, 30 plus so what, what percentage of people work with 30 or more Cold Fusion developers? 5%. Or even, oh, 5%. All right. Even if you take um, those two graphs, I mean, that's a decent chunk work at some pretty big places. Oh, yeah. There's some big companies using Cold Fusion. I mean, basically mm. the whole U.S. government, 70% of Fortune 1000 companies, you know, a lot of big companies. Use, I mean, I was taught, is, who's the user group manager at uh, Boeing? Um, is it Leon? I think if I get it. Oh, right. um, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I know what you're talking anyway, about. Anyway, he said they've got 200 and something about Cold Fusion developers at Boeing. So, uh, yeah, I know they have a really big, uh, group there. They're also, I believe, unfortunately in the process of leaving Cold Fusion as decided from a very high up management perspective, which is fairly disappointing. Uh, we need to get a mole into the company to kind of change that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe they have a valid reason, but I'm writing a book about cold fusion. No, I don't. CIOs, from the people so I've talked to, I don't believe there's a valid reason. Um, no, I, I don't either. But I don't know the exact reason. I believe it. Boeing, so I, I believe I it's. Know. I believe it may have started when the the Gartner report came out several years ago, claiming that cold fusion was in the dawn of obsolescence, which I believe they amended after the fact. But uh, I yeah. think that started some high level managers saying, "Oh, well, we should move away from this." Um, but anyway. Well, that, that Gardner report didn't wait. If you look at the methodology they use to calculate where on a, the programming yeah. language cycle like, clock a language goes using their own algorithm or method, they gave the wrong scoring to cold fusion. It should have been in the yeah. middle adult phase, not in the old age phase. Yeah. Um, and Adobe, so. Adobe told me that they weren't even consulted on that beforehand. You know, no, they, Gardner they didn't even talk. They to did them. some, clean up afterwards but um yeah well hopefully the next one they'll get it better so but, the majority I mean, that's of, a whole yeah. other topic of conversation yeah. to have i think all right so let's get through these last questions i only have a few minutes here yeah so how large is your organization looks like a lot of people work in small businesses one to 20 yeah. employees well this graph is a little distorting because You've got a, yes, the, the most popular place developers work is a small business, one to 20 employees, but you don't need many businesses that are, um, I don't see it, but somewhere we should have the one to 10,000 or the 10,000 plus thing. Uh, I think our labels got screwed up here. Yeah, but, it looks um, like it is. But anyway, you don't need many companies that have 10,000 employees to outweigh a whole lot of small businesses. So um, I'm not yeah. sure how to represent the data better. Um, 
Co-fusion user groups. Wow. Look, most people have never been. Uh, and the next most popular is once a year. I think it's something we need to rectify. And I, I just did an episode with a couple of co-fusion user group managers. Uh, if anyone listening is interested in starting a user group in their town, let me know. Well, yeah, because I'm curious how much of that never line uh, are people who it's not an option because there is no local user group for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe next year we can add an option that's, you know, never and I would, but there's nothing local or something. Because I have a feeling there a lot of people not going uh, might not have the option to go. You know? Right. Which is sad. Uh, let's see if we can change that. Conferences, another big topic. Unfortunately, none is the, uh, we need to have a conference called none. I mm, think. Yep, it'll be a whole suite. But Adobe uh, CF Summit's the most popular Yeah, conference. and that's not surprising because it is the most attended conference. There's, there's yes. regularly around 500 people. Um, yeah. I think we should try and bump that up this year. It's only $99 early bird price to go, so amazing Yeah, conference. Adobe subsidizes the cost of their conference because it's not cheap to put a conference on in Vegas, but they make it <laughs> cheap, which, not. which yeah. I mean, I, it's an amazing conference. I, in fact, I just submitted I, I, all my talk submissions for it this week. Yeah, yeah, I, I submitted a talk to it too. Um, I didn't, um, I don't know the Adobe budget numbers. You know, I don't have access to that, but just looking, having run a conference in Las Vegas, they've got to be dumping a mm -hmm. half a million dollars of marketing funding oh. into that conference. I yeah. Think, to, yeah. Subsidize it. And then I'm really happy that Adobe does that because they put on a really great conference and it's really cheap. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's first class. Comparatively. Anyway, other top conferences, CF camp in Europe, into the box in mm -hmm. Houston, Texas, which yeah. of course we into the, that. into the box. We had our biggest year this year. Um, we're almost nearly to a hundred people. So it's, it's growing every year. So I'm excited to see that, that bar slowly uh, increasing. Yeah, and CF Summit East uh, has bumped up a lot in recent years yeah. too. Yeah, Adobe has, has, has had the CF Summit in Vegas for a while, but they've started doing CF Summit East, and they also had CF Summit India this year, which I think which is, is really happening great. again. Happening again yeah. this year. CF so I, I love seeing Adobe doing that, kind of spreading the love around, because I mean, everybody's not going to travel to Vegas. That's, you know, so some I love people seeing are, them doing more localized stuff. Some people's bosses are allergic to Vegas and won't let them travel there <laughs> well, just in case they get up to naughty behavior. Yeah, that I, I definitely I've seen that be an issue. So what do we have here? What's this cold, question? Cold fusion online communities. Oh yes. So CF Slack channel is the uh, most popular community. Um, Three thousand people now. Three thousand. I mean, yeah, I not all, all online at the same a, time, but uh, yeah, I think you so have well, some more formatting there with the. Yeah some formatting issue um, and then stack overflow. Now, the only thing I will say, I see if Slack is wonderful, very responsive, lots of smart people, pretty well behaved. I would say at this point, <laughs> um, the only thing is it's totally invisible to the outside world. Yeah. Um, and then it's when Gar Gartner or Forrester look at how popular is cold fusion, they're like, Oh, well, no one ever posts about cold fusion. Well, yeah. Duh, and, I've, that's and I've seen somewhere else. Yeah, I've seen a reduction in traffic on like the cold box mailing list with the advent of the CFML Slack because people can get, you know, faster conversational answers. But you're right. Mm -hmm. When you Google for just content on the Internet related to cold fusion, uh, Slack is a black hole in that regard. And it's not yeah. persistent. You know, within a month or two, you, you're probably sooner your messages are gone. So it's a bit of a yeah. double edged sword. Um, it's a very good, fast, active community, but it's also not visible to the outside world. I think we need to come up with some solution for that. Uh, Lucy that's... Discourse is a is really a great uh, community. They use Discourse, obviously, mm -hmm. in the name, uh, which is an off the shelf third party kind of forum software. Uh, that's a really pretty good forum software. You can have wiki entries. You can you know have accepted answers, um, and it has a lot better visibility on the internet as well. So I think more uh, more conversation should happen in Discourse, um, even though obviously it's specific to Lucy. Yeah, well, we could have a whole discussion about this, but let's move on to uh, CF Live podcast. Most people have never listened to this podcast. <laughs> uh, how dare they? I chew them out, but they're not here to hear me. There you go. It's uh, if, if, uh, we are well, but you know, plenty of people do listen to it at least once a year or more than once a year. And I've certainly talked to people who basically just have it get all the episodes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think even if you just listen occasionally, you know, the podcasts are a great source of information just to find out what's going on. Um, and that's why we have the modernizer die podcast as well, just to, you know, hopefully people will hear things and they'll, you know, hear about 
new happenings or conferences because a lot of times people just don't know. They don't even know yeah. that into the box is a thing. They don't know that a training is yeah. happening. They don't know the command box exists. You know, whatever it is, they don't have their ear to the ground. And podcasts like uh, like CF Alive and Modernize or Die are just a great way for people to kind of keep up with everything going on if they don't have time to read every single, you know, tweet that flows across the Tweety pages. So. I'm well, hoping maybe that... we need to, uh, I mean, Adobe have been putting third party things into their, um, you know, uh, cold fusion newsletter. Uh, I've seen stuff from integral and Charlie Earhart and a few other folks. Maybe we need to get some of these other things like these podcasts, you know, the CF live one, the modernize or die one, um, and mm. some other third party stuff into their newsletter. So it gets out to other people, you know? Yeah. Okay. Just a couple minutes here. Let's get these last ones. All right. Development setup. Uh, most people using a local instance of Cold Fusion or shared development server. Command box is moving up. Woot woot. You want me to come back to that? Oh I, no! I'm, I'm just, just I'm just woot woot by. The command box. <laughs> woot woot. Okay. I put my foot on the gas so we can get yep, that yep, yep. wrapped up. Uh, production deployments mostly uh, on a, their own server they build. Uh, next popular is managed server containers has cool. come up since last year. I think Yeah, definitely uh, increasing up. containers. Yes. Um, hosting services in house is the most popular. And then Amazon is uh, next most popular. Yeah. And a AMI is was ranked very highly in the previous question. So that's not incredibly surprising. And then of the hosts, it looks like host tech, may be the thing as yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we host our stuff on DigitalOcean. Of course, you know, DigitalOcean yeah. doesn't provide uh, Cold Fusion hosting specifically, but we don't care. We just run our Docker Swarm there. Yeah, we, we run our Docker Swarm. Yeah. And somebody asked about Cold Fusion hosting the other day in the Lucy Discourse forum. And, and I told them, you know, don't don't look for Cold Fusion hosting specifically. Just look for a VPS or, you know, or yeah. a, a DigitalOcean droplet and you can put, you know, whatever you want on there. And then uh, speaking of Docker, Docker Images, uh, I don't know what other is. We'll see what they have to say, but um, made a custom image and then official Lucy image for autists. Yeah. Come on, There's a lot image. of people that kind of surprises me, to be honest, making custom images. And I would be interested to know why they're doing that. And if it's something that if they're missing the feature, they could just be easily added. The, you know, the yeah. command box based image that Ortis makes is incredibly flexible and powerful. Um, I think mm. people could probably save a lot of time if they were to piggyback on some of the existing things out there. All right. Deployment and build tools. Well, most people uh, don't automate their deployments, which <laughs> I think is probably wah, a mistake. Wah. But if you are doing it, Jenkins is the most popular one. And then yes, there's it is. A widespread between Ant Bamboo. Command box know. task runners. Yeah. Yeah. Gulp. Uh, Get that grunt and gulp out of there. Get <laughs> gulp out of there. Who names these products? You know, it's like, you know, uh, the joke is with JavaScript libraries, you can take any noun in the dictionary and put .js and you have a library. So it's... <laughs> None.js, yeah. Um, monitoring tools, another important thing. Um, Fusion React is the clear winner on this. Half of the people using that. Mm -hmm. uh, Cold Fusion Serta Monitor is picking up. And of course, Cold Fusion 2018, they put a whole performance monitor in. That's yep. really powerful. It ticked off uh, the integral guys, I think. <laughs> Maybe we should not dig into that too much. Yeah. But if you're not doing monitoring, do some monitoring. Yeah. Uh, lockdown. Uh, mo half people use the lockdown guides. Uh, next most popular is your own security pro protocols. Uh, letting other people deal with it, like DevOps. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, there's a new automatic yeah. lockdown uh, stuff you can do too, Pete. Exactly, Pete yeah, with Adobe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we might have to come back and grab some of these later because I am at a hard stop now. So we will stop the screen share. We will thank Brad for being here and uh, we will catch up with this another time. I'm going to stop recording. Thank you, Brad. Right.